So we're on the home stretch. The uh, next presenter will deliver the, the closing keynote. And after that, in the tent outside, the uh, wine corks will be opened and the food will be laid out. For the Innovation Showcase, we have 10 very exciting early stage companies that we'd like to present to you, and I'm sure they'd like to meet you as well. Uh, we'll also have Authors Row, which will feature three books, uh, including Andy McAfee and Eric Brynjolfsson's uh, New York Times bestseller, The Second Machine Age, uh, Tom Davenport's Big Data uh, uh, book, and uh, Sandy Pentland's Social Physics books, and they'll be out there to sign those books for you, so we'll see you out there in a moment. But first, I have the privilege of introducing Andy McAfee, Andy is a principal research scientist at the Sloan School. He is co-director of the new initiative on the digital economy. He is a son of MIT with at least three degrees that I know of. He did, however, spend some time up the river at, uh, at Harvard. I think that's where he lost his hair. <laughs> but he's returned to MIT and converted his ties into pocket squares. Uh, Andy is uh, 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 just has a real knack of explaining complex um, issues that, that, that make it not only interesting but uh, under, understandable for, for all of us. And the impact of the work that Andy's doing, uh, the impact of technology on business is critical for all of us. So uh, let me invite Andy onto the stage and let him uh, close the place down. Andy. <laughs> That invitation sounded a lot like what we used to say in our intramural baseball teams back here at MIT when we were giving each other a hard time, which was, hey, grab a bat and stop this rally. <laughs> so I'm here to close this place down, evidently. And I have to say that um, I think this is our second or third year doing it this way. And this has evolved, honestly, to be one of my favorite talks all throughout the year. It's good, really good to come back here because it's very short. The, the wine and the hors d'oeuvres are very, very close at hand. You all are so shell-shocked by sitting here listening for an entire day that you're in the mood for anything kind of weird and different. And I'm in the mood to do something a little bit weird and different. So let's just have some fun, shoot our mouths off for 20 minutes, then go have a drink. Uh, please come by, get a book signed, and say hi afterward. So where are we? Oh, can I get my slides up on the screen? Please. This is not the kind of weird that we were looking forward to. There we are. Um, the game of chess actually provides one of my favorite examples for where we are in the interplay between people and computers. Because as soon as we invented computers, we started trying to teach them to play chess and to compete against real human beings. And there were these very confident predictions in the 50s and 60s that because chess is such a logical game, the rules are very simple to understand, computers are good at following rules, that within a few short years, computers would be the world's best chess players. And that's not what happened. Decades went by. And this is a picture of Gary Kasparov. I've actually had the, the pleasure of talking to him about technological progress. He actually blurbed our book, which I thought was phenomenally cool. And Kasparov says that he was the world chess champion during a really interesting period. When he became the world chess champion in the mid-'80s, as an exhibition, he played 32 simultaneous matches against the best chess computers of that time. Simultaneous, he won 32 to nothing. The computers at that stage were laughably bad at playing the game of chess when they went up against an absolute world-class human being. We see him here playing 10 years later, playing in 1997 against Deep Blue, against a purpose-built supercomputer to go up against Kasparov. And Kasparov narrowly lost that match and at that point, the torch got passed from human to digital labor in this specific domain of knowledge work, in this very specific domain of playing chess. That was the last time humans could claim superiority. Now, that head-to-head -head competition is not even close. The chess programs available on smartphones these days can beat almost anybody. And the best chess computers uh, just make mincemeat out of the absolute top human chess players in the world. It's so bad now that they asked a grandmaster a little while back how he would prepare for a match against a computer, and he said, I'd bring a hammer. 
It took decades, though. What we're observing now is something a little bit different, which is the digital progress is getting a lot faster. Hemingway has a fantastic quote about how a person goes broke. He says, it's gradually and then suddenly. We've been in the gradual portion for a long time on some very tough problems, like natural language processing, like answering problems that aren't very well structured. We're now in the sudden part. The best example of this we came across recently was playing the game of Jeopardy, where you see two of the world's best knowledge workers in this domain, Ken Jennings and Brad Rutter, getting crushed in early 2011 by Watson, by another purpose-built supercomputer. What's fascinating to me about this example is this one didn't take decades. The IBM team started its work in late 2006. It took them about four years, just a little more than four years, to get so good that the absolute best knowledge workers in this domain were not any good at all. Just got steamrolled by the competition after four years of concerted effort. Ken Jennings uh, had a wonderful sense of humor about the whole thing. And he had a, a quote that kind of summarizes this head-to-head -head competition between human labor and digital labor in, in a lot of knowledge domains. He said, um, after he got beat, I, for one, welcome our new computer overlords. <laughs> he realized that in his very narrow, very specialized domain of knowledge work, again, the torch had been passed, and in a head-to-head -head competition, the machines were better than the people. And when we talk about this and give these examples of technological progress and technology racing past people, we, we very often get different flavors of, wait a minute, what about the following? For example, what about work in the physical world? What about you know, work that we do with our bodies? Technologies, robots, vehicles have been laughably bad. The, there's an old paradox that the easy stuff is hard and the hard stuff is easy. Any of us can walk across a room. Any of us can do this very easily. Robots and other physical machines, digital physical machines, are still really bad at a lot of that. But they're getting better super quickly. Um, burger flipper is kind of shorthand for an unenviable job that's always available. I'm not so sure anymore. Here's a completely automated hamburger making machine. It will evidently turn out 300 completely customized burgers an hour. Backing up one big step in the value chain, we've also got robots that will milk cows these days. And evidently the cows like this better because instead of getting milked at dawn and dusk, they just kind of pull in. It's not the filling station, I guess it's the emptying station. They just pull in whenever they feel the need and walk away feeling better about their life on the farm. Uh, robots are now at least probably better milkers of cows than we are. We see this all over the place. We are still better at walking across a room, but clever people at Kiva and companies like this have designed little, dro little squashed orange R2-D2s that do the walking around warehouses these days. So people don't walk the floor anymore. Those Kiva robots bring the shelves to the remaining human workers in the warehouse. Uh, Eric and I had the chance to ride in the Google autonomous car. We're here to tell you by our survival that it actually works pretty well. And it feels like it's only a matter of time before we've got maybe in more remotely populated areas before the convoy, convoys become completely autonomous. Going up into some of the most taxing, really physically demanding jobs, real Top Gun type stuff. Just last year, for the first time, they took off and landed a completely autonomous drone aircraft on the deck of a naval carrier. This is one of the hardest things for a human being to do. If the technology already isn't better than a Navy Top Gun pilot at that, it will be fairly soon. So even in the physical world, we see technology encroaching deeply, broadly, and rapidly, which brings up another but what about question. What about work that, that appeals to our taste? What about work that appeals to our aesthetic sense? Here is a painting. This is a drawing actually done by a, a robot called E. David. This is one done by a painting program called The Painted Fool. And I want to be clear, these are not Photoshop filters applied to a picture that a person took or a drawing that a person did. This is absolutely generated from scratch artwork. Maybe I just have terrible taste, but you know, I would kind of put these on my wall and be happy with them. Again, humans still hold the high ground here, but a mantra that I learned while researching the book was never say never. 
One final domain where people ask, what about, well, what about what we're doing right here? What about interpersonal skills? What about things like reading another's emotions or negotiating or managing or selling to them? Yes, absolutely, but let's think about the encroachment here as well. This is the best salesperson that I interact with every day. This is Amazon recommending the next round of stuff for me to buy with one click, and they do a surprisingly good job of it. This is, these are all books that Amazon recommended to me earlier today, and I found myself going, yep, 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 yep. I would go read all of those. Um, we humans are wired by evolution to sense what's going on with the emotions of others, but it turns out we can do a surprisingly good job of teaching that as well. This is emotion detecting software. I believe it's already as good as the average guy. <laughs> and maybe someday we'll get up into the area of, of, of female ability to, to understand what's going on with another human being, even though that's a fairly rarefied talent that very few men at MIT actually possess. Um, we should probably be clear about that. So again, this encroachment that we're seeing, this technological progress is, is, is very broad, very rapid, very deep, and, and feels like it's leaving few, if any, stones unturned. Technology is racing ahead. It brings up this pretty fundamental question, are we going to be left behind? Are we headed for some era of mass technological unemployment? In other words, do we have nothing left to bring to the economy or bring to the party in the face of this just astonishing technological progress? And the answer to that, fortunately, is I don't think so even after spending a lot of time immersing myself in examples of technological progress and being stunned over and over again at what's going on. I also see enough examples that convince me that we still have roles to play, even in this very, very technologically sophisticated economy that we're creating so quickly. Let me give you three quick examples there. I want to go back to chess for the first example. You remember that I said that the head-to-head -head competition between people and machines in chess is profoundly uninteresting these days. That's true. What's profoundly interesting is this. This is a freestyle tournament where you can bring any combination of human and digital labor and have it compete against other teams composed of arbitrary combinations of human plus digital. And what we learn from these freestyle tournaments so far is pretty fantastic. What we learn is that the, a, the rightly Con composed team will beat any grandmaster. It will beat any the best chess supercomputer. It will actually beat the top grandmaster with the best chess supercomputer. Because the way to compose a team is to be very insightful about what people are good at versus what technology is good at and bring both of those strengths together. So what's going on with these tournaments, the winning teams these days, are really geeky people, very, very good computer scientists, who are at least pretty competent chess players, but they know how to put those two kinds of ability and skill together to let the people concentrate on what they are best at. And as in Kasparov's terms, that's coming up with a new idea. And even in a terrain as well explored as chess, there's still room for that spark of eureka. While the computers maybe tee up candidates and make sure that what the person comes up with is not a move that's actually going to get you in trouble three or four moves down the road. So we've got the, the computers teeing up interesting things, backstopping to make sure the people aren't making dumb mistakes, and that frees up the people to exercise their creativity, their spark, which the results show is still extraordinarily valuable. We see this over and over again. This is an amazing computer game called Foldit that simulates the folding of an actual protein. Uh, our cells are assembly lines for proteins, but just in the first milliseconds after they're created, they fold into their final shape, and we have no idea how. We can't simulate it, we can't bake it into software, we understand it very poorly. A really bright team of people a while back said, why don't we use the spatial reasoning abilities of human beings, tell them what rules we have, and get them to fold these proteins using whatever tools are between their ears, and we'll see if that will actually help us out. It turns out that the distributed crowd of people playing Foldit 
usually does a better job at getting the final structure right than our best, most massive computers running simulations these days. What's even more interesting to me is who the people, the top folded competitors are. They tend not to be computer scientists or, bi or biochemists or doctors. They tend to be folk like this. Michael is a ninth grader. If he's had more than one biology class or chemistry class, I'd be really impressed by now. But he likes to play computer games. He spends hours a day getting good at it. And he and people like him are advancing our understanding of proteinomics by playing a computer game. I find that really fantastic and very hopeful for the future as well. The last example I want to give is one in the physical world. This is Baxter, which is a creation of um, MIT legend Rodney Brooks, the guy that brought us the Roomba. This is his latest creation, which is a uh, $20,000 humanoid robot that's intended to get a day's work done on the factory floor, which it does really well. Baxter works side by side with actual human beings. What's going on in this picture, though, is something even more impressive. What's going on here is that that person, that frontline worker in the manufacturing facility, is programming Baxter. And the way you program Baxter is not with a command line interface or a programming language. You grab it by the arms, you move it through the motions you want it to do, and you essentially say, you got that? Baxter says, yeah, no problem, and then goes on about the work. So these are fantastic new combinations of bringing people together with machines. These are not straightforward examples of substitution. These are examples of complements, of people coming together with technologies to do things better than either alone. I want to wind up with a couple watchwords that I think we need to keep in mind as we're designing our, our institutions and our organizations for the future. What should we, what, what, what policies, what watchwords should guide us? The first one is probably not that controversial to this crowd. It's innovation. The only way we are going to succeed in the second machine age is by continuing to innovate with our technologies. But more importantly, I trust the technologists, more importantly with our institutions, our policies, our business models, our educational systems, all of these other things that need to come together to create a great deal of value. Innovation sounds like an uncontroversial thing, especially here at MIT, but I want to point out a couple other watchwords that people appear to be using that I think are actually counterproductive in a lot of ways. Many folks seem obsessed with protection as a watchword. In other words, let's make sure that no one loses their job as a result of this new thingy out there. It's an absolutely terrible idea. It leads to these perversities like the fact that in Tampa, Florida right now, a limo has to charge at least $50 and wait for an hour before picking anybody up. Huh? This is a response of the, this is legislation that was supported by the taxi industry in the face of innovations like Uber. It's a terrible idea. In three states right now, you cannot order a Tesla automatic car from the showrooms the company has set up because of auto dealership protection laws in place. These are all efforts, this is a great phrase that Larry Lessig uses, these are all efforts to protect the past from the future not to protect the future from the past. And that latter is absolutely what we should be doing. The former is what we're doing way too much of. The other watchword we need to keep in mind, in addition to innovation, is inclusiveness, is bringing as many people along for the ride as possible, in every sense of the word, as workers, as participants, as people bought into our communities and societies. Notice the word I'm not using here is equality. I, like, I don't dislike equality at all. I like inclusiveness a lot better. Um, how many have ever heard of the book that Thomas Piketty just wrote called Capital in the 21st Century? Yeah, look, everyone's hand goes up. <laughs> I, you know, Eric and I wrote the book that people were talking about for a while, and then it feels like Piketty's book came out, and the whole crowd went, oh, wow, let's go look over here. <laughs> so thanks for that. Um, it's, a fan, it's an amazing book. It's a fantastic book. The problem is that Piketty's solutions are extraordinarily high taxes, deliberately confiscatory taxes on people at the top, on the 1% and the 1% of the 1%. His idea is let's basically take away their income and their wealth. Let's enforce e uh, e uh, equality, egalitarianism that way. And when you, he's explicit in the book, he says, look, doing this will not actually help out the people at the middle and the bottom very much. 
it's just the right thing for us to do because I guess rich people are bad. I don't, under, I don't get it. If it's a solution, the solution that's not going to help the struggling middle class, the middle class that's being hollowed out, the people being left behind by our educational systems, it is solving absolutely the wrong problem. So if we get our, our guiding words right, if we focus on things like innovation and inclusiveness, as opposed to things like complete egalitarianism or protecting the status quo, if we get those watchwords right, I like our chances a lot even as we head deeper into the second machine age. Why don't we call it a day and have a drink? Thanks very much. Wow, what a day. Uh, I just want to make one observation based on uh, Andy's observations. If we uh, want to computer that can interpret emotions as well as women is going to be, have to be programmed by women. <laughs> um, so uh, we've started uh, with a tremendous day. We had a lot of great speakers. Um, I want to thank the speakers, the sponsors, and uh, we had 40 people um, come from uh, international. And uh, so you know about the tent, you know about the drinks, you know about the hors d'oeuvres, and all I can say is thank you. <laughs>